So some of the um, considerations for client and community that we're going to be asking our client about, that we're going to be conscious about when we're trying to assess the um, viability or validity of writing or providing an emotional support letter is all of these. So we talked about allergies. Um, the thing with allergies is a lot of people are becoming more sensitive, um, particularly to dogs and cats. And when you get into a closed environment like a plane, um, there could be complaints about that. And what happens is it's not really going to come be blowback on you, but for the airline, they have to accommodate the person who's allergic and they have to accommodate the person who has the ESA or the SA. So um, in, that can be challenging when you're talking about a full flight. So you're trying to, you know, really juggle around seats, um, you know, before the flight takes off to make everybody happy because they don't want to be liable. And then you throw in somebody that says, oh, well, while we're at it, I'm actually phobic of dogs. I'm so afraid of dogs that I can't even, I'm, I can't even handle the fact that he's even on this plane with me right now. You know, so we got to accommodate that. So do we put them, you know, far apart from each other? Like, what do we do? So we have to um, take all of those things into consideration. And we have to ask our clients, have you thought about that? That there might be somebody with a phobia? What would happen if that situation occurred when you were on the plane? Or what happened if you were in an apartment complex and your um, landlord allowed you to let the ESA come in to live with you, but your neighbor was afraid of dogs? You know, we have to be able to navigate that with the client and be able to know that they have, I always call them the plan B, C, and D in case anything goes wrong in any situation. We have to think about injuries. So, you know, again, animals are unpredictable. If they're very well trained, that's great. There's a better chance, um, less risk that there's going to be an injury involved due to a bite or some kind of aggressive behavior. Um, it could be... Um, Again, just they're nervous. Um, they've never been on a plane before. It could be a kid is screaming. Oh my gosh, I just saw a video on TikTok the other day where a kid was screaming for eight hours on a flight. Can you imagine if this poor emotional support animal was on the flight? So yeah, we have to be aware of that, um, especially with kids on a flight. Sometimes they're letting them run up and down the, the galleyway. And if the um, emotional support animal was out in there too and wasn't expecting it, he could be aggressive and we don't know. So we, we always want to be sure um, our client is aware of all of these potentials and to make sure that we're assessing that um, the pet isn't going to react in those situations. Sorry, I don't know why my phone is going off. Um, and we have to also be um, conscious of damage to property. So whether that's um, eliminating on a floor in an apartment complex um, inappropriately, whether that's, um, I had one client whose emotional support dog um, developed a severe separation anxiety from her. And um, she kept him in a separate room with TV and music and all the stuff and gave him an um, anti-anxiolytic and all this stuff. But when she came home, her door was shredded. So if this was in a situation where it was a rental, you can imagine the dismay that could potentially cause. Um, we're also looking at damage, um, like if you're talking about emotional support animals and that they could be other than dogs and cats, we're looking at damage that birds can do to the home. We're looking at damage to miniature horses can do. Um, there's all kinds of different things, you know, we're thinking about what kind of emotional support animal we're dealing with and what kind of damage could potentially happen and making sure that our client has a contingency plan and has all of that covered.